Um, I did want to transition and introduce our first speaker for the day. I'm very pleased to announce that Dr. Clinton Campbell from the United States Department of Agriculture is here with us today. And he has an amazing presentation that I've seen before and I'm excited to see it again. So take it away, Dr. Campbell. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, Clinton Campbell with the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service plant protection and quarantine. And today I will be talking about invasive species and pests to some extent. Uh, a lot of it will be on pathway management. I will also talk about uh, IPM success. And then the intent is to try to tie all of these together. Invasive species, topic number one. Now you already know what an invasive species is, but it's useful to look at the factors that have to come together to enable an invasive species to establish. So first, uh, in terms of looking at something familiar to help establish relationships and things, I thought we'd look at the plant disease triangle. And essentially, this familiar example shows that for you to have a plant disease, you typically need three factors that in and among themselves can have various elements and so on. But to have a plant disease, you have to have the presence of a pathogen, a suitable host, and a favorable environment. So those are the things that have to come together for plant diseases. With invasive species, the um, risk of getting an invasive species uh, may also include many elements, but it can be similarly reduced to three factors. And again, the emphasis here is on the risk of getting an invasive species. So here, again, similarly, suitable climate, uh, some sort of a host or other resource, and then very importantly, a pathway. So next we'll look a little bit at pathways and management. Uh, a pathway is simply the manner in which an invasive species gets from point A to point B. Pathway examination is a part of risk analysis. There are various components of a risk analysis, some of which evaluate attributes and aspects of a pest or potential invasive species. In this example here, uh, this is taken from an international uh, standard, as it were. Uh, across the world, there are member countries who belong to the International Plant Protection Convention. And the idea is to try to, uh, you know, facilitate the trade of plant products and other commodities with a uh, reduction, certainly in the uh, pest risk of moving those materials. And so in this case, this is a uh, standard number two uh, framework for pest risk analysis. And you'll see among the different items there, uh, there's one that's highlighted called identification of a pathway. So what this is saying is that, yes, a pathway and the identification of it is one of the fundamental things that has to be examined, should be examined certainly, for doing a pest risk analysis. And among these components, uh, pathway is the main one that involves management. And ideally that management takes the form of prevention. So looking a little bit at pathways themselves, an objective today is to have us take a simpler look at pathways. And specifically, the message is anything that moves can move an invasive species. And the graphics there are to help remind us that uh, certainly conveyances of various sorts are prime methods of movement. Live plants can be a tremendously important pathway for moving plant pests, obviously. But you also have things like livestock, uh, human-aided movement, wind, water, and wildlife. Again, anything that moves can move an invasive species. 
Next, we'll look a little bit at the value of what I call atypical pathways. Now, many invasive species pathways are known and often thought to be well understood, but atypical pathways have demonstrated that we can go beyond these detailed risk analyses and think along the simpler lines of anything that moves can move an invasive species. So to help demonstrate this is a good case study involving the Asian gypsy moth, Lymantria dispar. Now here in Washington, the European form of the gypsy moth has been a quarantine and program pest for over 40 years. And the Asian form of the gypsy moth has been a quarantine and program pest since the early 1990s. Now the gypsy moth is not native to North America in any form, whether it's European form or Asian form. European form was deliberately brought to Eastern North America in 1869 for what were at that time well-intentioned purposes, but things did not work out. And then uh, it's spread since then, which we'll look at a little later. And then the Asian gypsy moth started showing up uh, decades later. And in the graphic there, you see the male and you also see the uh, female moth laying uh, an egg mass. One important thing to mention, the European form, uh, only the males can fly. In the Asian form, both the male and the female can fly. So that adds to the risk. In 1991, concurrent with the fall of the Soviet Union, ships from what were once military ports in Eastern Russia began arriving as commercial vessels on the west coast of North America. A new pathway was open and with it came Asian gypsy moth. The typical pathway for Asian gypsy moth throughout the 1990s involved commercial ships with eggs laid on those ships. Uh, many eradications followed and virtually all of them were here in Washington. Fast forwarding a few years then, uh, we had an example in the Port of Vancouver, Washington in 2014 involving steel slabs from Russia. And then the bottom two photos, uh, you'll see pictures of those slabs. They're as big or bigger than a bus. And uh, the uh, Customs and Border Protection inspectors and so on who look at ships and things that are on the ships uh, we're, of course, examining these slabs for any kinds of pests. And lo and behold, they started finding Asian gypsy moth egg masses, as is shown in the smaller bottom graphic. So, you know, again, this is something that uh, in a way might have been expected just because it was, you know, movement of materials from Asia. But even so, there were uh, certain differences. So. Was this a, a new atypical Asian gypsy moth pathway? Well, the answer is yes. In 2013 and 2014, there was an Asian gypsy moth outbreak in Eastern Russia, which included the coastal town of Nakata. And apparently what made circumstances unique in that case was the fuel prices for ships were low enough in that coastal town that a number of the vessels from Russia decided they would go up there and get their fuel. And of course, there was an Asian gypsy moth outbreak happening. And so understandably, I guess, the risk for Asian gypsy moth uh, laying eggs on the ships and cargo increased. And of course, what we saw here on the West Coast was things like these steel slabs with Asian gypsy moth. So, you know, an atypical pathway that had once started as just commercial shipping from Russia to the coast of North America, then took a bit of a turn for a while in that uh, fuel prices actually then affected the pathway and changed, changed it such that we got Asian gypsy moth probably from this particular infestation. Next, we'll look a little bit at pathway management. The practice of pathway management is nothing new. Prevention is always the most preferred approach in management. 
practical pathway management can be applied regardless of the various terms which may be used, such as exotic pests, invasive species, and so on. So pathway management uh, has a number of elements, and we'll look at uh, focus on those that have to do with prevention methods of pathway management. These include exclusion offshore, exclusion at ports of entry, inspections and mitigation, detection surveys, quarantine, and very importantly, outreach and education. An example of prevention involving exclusion offshore is what's referred to as the Greater Caribbean Safeguarding Initiative. And essentially in the Caribbean region and other places, uh, one of the big concerns are fruit flies, true fruit flies, like Caribbean fruit fly. Uh, think medfly as an example, same kind of thing almost. And in this case, the exclusion took the form of, you know, building partnerships and networks throughout that region so that collectively there could be more exclusion work done to prevent things from maybe even getting, you know, onto conveyances to get shipped in the first place. Uh, there could be enhanced pest detection activities, and then there could also be methods employed to mitigate and suppress fruit fly populations in countries that might uh, allow it to be moved to other countries. And, you know, in, in no small part would have been something like Florida being uh, something that we would have been interested in safeguarding, certainly from some of these other fruit flies. Another prevention uh, method is exclusion at the ports of entry. As mentioned with the steel slab example, the uh, Department of Homeland Security Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, they're the ones who inspect shipping containers and other things, of course, that come in on uh, various conveyances, whether they're ships, planes, et cetera. And so, so that kind of prevention through the, uh, you know, at port arrival inspections and so on has a lot to do with managing that particular pathway because if something is found at a port of entry and it's recognized and identified as being a pest of concern, there are a number of methods that can be employed with that particular cargo. In some cases, it can be returned to the point of origin. It could be destroyed on site, or in some cases, depending on circumstances, it could be treated such as through fumigation. Another method of prevention in terms of pathway has to do with uh, inspection, but uh, of a little different sort. Uh, mentioned earlier live plants, and live plants, of course, in, in their various forms, whether it's seeds, cuttings, et cetera, can uh, certainly bring pests with them, as we know. And in this case, uh, imported propagative materials are inspected for pests and diseases across the United States uh, near ports of entry. There are 17 or 18 uh, what are called plant inspection stations that USDA has that uh, have as one of their primary functions the inspection of live plants and plant parts for pests. And so this uh, is an important function. Prevention also, of course, takes the form of detection. And a lot of that is done through trapping. And here in the state of Washington, uh, we have a very uh, uh, well-crafted, uh, well-oiled detection trapping setup that has been very successful over the last 40 years in helping keep out the gypsy moth, for example, from becoming established. Prevention also takes the form of quarantines. This is the quarantine, federal quarantine for gypsy moth, in this case, the European gypsy moth, because it is established in the Northeast and mostly those counties that are shaded in red are part of what's called the permanently infested area. And the idea with a quarantine, of course, is that uh, you really, with certain things that are especially high risk, don't want things to leave the quarantine area unless they've been inspected or treated in some manner to mitigate the risk of pest movement. 
And then the last uh, method has to do with outreach and education. Very, very important. And a good example here, of course, is the work done by the Washington Invasive Species Council. This picture from the, uh, the home page of the council. And with regard to outreach and education, you see here in the graphic, there's uh, certain elements of school curricula, uh, on-demand webinar libraries, and then other types of uh, resources such as readiness plans. And of course, this kind of outreach and education has great value in that it can, you know, start to helping people at an early age and they can carry it with them and, and be all the more skilled and aware of invasive species risks and threats uh, more so than was the case a number of decades ago. And of course, uh, as you would expect, pathways are recognized in this uh, outreach and education realm. And so uh, there's a section at the website about the addressing of pathways. And now I'll turn to the third portion of this, which is having to do with integrated pest management or IPM. And of course, this graphic shows the various methods and tools that are rather fundamental to IPM in terms of integrating methods to deal with pests, biocontrol, cultural control, chemical, physical, host plant resistance. But key among that also is monitoring, whether it's trapping or other methods. So uh, very important that we uh, always keep both of these things in mind. I have here a definition of IPM out of the University of California system, which is I think somewhat uh, fitting because essentially IPM as a concept was generated decades ago in California. And I'll just read this. Uh, IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques, I highlighted that, such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and use of resistant varieties. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates they are needed according to established guidelines, and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms, and the environment. And again, the key things here really for me have always been combination of techniques and monitoring. Now, somebody like me has on their wall things like the spraying calendar for the state of Washington for 1913. And this is a rather fascinating document in a variety of ways. And it is a calendar, and yet it's not a calendar in another way that I'll, I'll talk about momentarily. But uh, in this particular calendar, here's a section, a little hard to read, but it is 1913, uh, having to do with pests that affect foliage. And it talks about, in the right-hand block, about certain tools and things that you might use for some of these pests. And of course, it references things like uh, zinc arsenite, lead arsenate, uh, lime, ashes, road dust, tobacco spray, sulfur, and so on. Because at that time, these were some of the emerging tools that were available. Now, with this particular spray calendar, it'll say things like spray as soon as, et cetera. It doesn't necessarily say, you know, spray every seven days, every 10 days, but chances are those kinds of things probably were part of normal practice, at least this is what my professors uh, often would say. So that was the, the situation happening here in the state of Washington over 100 years ago. Now here's a bit of information from across the country, but it's worth looking at for the same reason. It says around the turn of the 20th century, the use of arsenical pesticides became prominent in the United States, especially for insect pest control. Lead arsenate was employed extensively on apple orchards, but was also used for control of agricultural pests in vegetable fields and other fruit orchards. Golf courses and turf farms also received applications of lead arsenate on a regular basis. Potato fields received applications of calcium arsenate. By 1917, this is about the same time as the calendar, 
The routine use of lead arsenate was initially recommended by New Jersey on apple and peach crops. Use recommendations continued until 1967 when the use of synthetic organic pesticides became established. So for about 50 years, what this is saying is that, you know, on a kind of a regular basis, which could very well have been a calendar basis, X number of days, that kind of thing, is when, you know, these kind of products at which initially they were fairly limited started to be used. So it was a matter of you use them, but it wasn't necessarily a matter of use them if, if you need to because something's there type of thing. So anyway, uh, even now, IPM, though, is not always uh, based as a term on monitoring results and not always described that way. Here's a fairly recent example from 2016 where, it, with, with reference to the light brown apple moth, there's a mention of IPM practices implemented by producers, including the routine use of chemical applications, et cetera, et cetera. So, while we tend to think of IPM ideally as involving very keenly monitoring, uh, sometimes references to routine use of chemical applications is mentioned. Now, whether this is referring to cover sprays or other things, it's not made clear. But as you saw in the reference from New Jersey, the idea was routine stuff had been going on for 50 years. But ignoring the anomalies, such as I just showed you, IPM, as intended, is alive and well in the pest management realm, and this includes invasive species pathway management. And these handbooks uh, from this year help demonstrate that. As you know, there are handbooks for insects, plant diseases, and weeds. And here's an example from the, uh, the weed handbook. Uh, it shows that, of course, as you know, integrated weed, weed management recommendations are readily available, biocontrol, uh, chemical control, uh, agronomic control. And monitoring is not neglected. That's a very good thing, as described below in a, another piece of information where it talks about uh, forages and so on. And it mentions that uh, how is the concept of IPM applied in controlling weeds and forages? And it says, first, a forage producer should carefully examine. So you see that the monitoring component is, is well ingrained in this, in addition to the uh, you know, multiple range of methods available for dealing with weeds or other things. So that's, that's a great thing. So in conclusion, kind of trying to tie this all together, because monitoring is as fundamental to IPM as is integrating various management techniques, pathway management, which maintains a monitoring core in terms of applying the anything that moves mindset and thus applies vigilant detection methods for exotic species, is what connects IPM practice to successful pest and invasive species prevention and or management. And I'll uh, probably just wait for any uh, questions for the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. Apologies, there are several med leaf blowing outside my apartment, so of course it's loud. Um, yes, and that is an excellent reminder. So we are gonna have time at the end of today to have question and answer sessions with our panelists. Um, so if you do have any questions for Dr. Campbell, please put them in that questions pane. If you have any other 